everybody. Welcome back to The Smattering, where we like to answer the important questions about investing. I'm Jason Hall, joined by the voice of people, Jeff Santoro. Hey, Jeff. Hey, hey. How you doing, buddy? I'm good. I'm good. This was a this was a fun week. Um, earlier, we interviewed John Maxfield. Uh, you can find him on Twitter, Maxfield on Banks. That's the first part of this show. I think it turned out really good. John is very deep and kind of staccato and all over the place. And the conversation was fantastic. I said it at the beginning of the interview, but, and this is kind of the way I think about it. If you want to be a better investor, you need to understand banks and banking. What, what were you, what was your, what was your quick takeaway before we do a little housekeeping here? My quick takeaway is that he's brilliant and knows he's probably forgotten more about banks than I'll ever know. And I was really happy to have him on because banking and, and REITs are the two sort of um, things I own that I don't understand as much as I want to. And, yeah. um, you know, we didn't dive too much into like the nitty gritty of analyzing a bank stock or anything like that, but his high level understanding of the industry and, you know, the way he framed some of the big picture ideas were, were really interesting. So I think anyone who listens is going to really enjoy it. And then they should go right out and follow John on Twitter because there's more great information there. And I, and I know he's going to talk a little bit on the pod about um, a new thing he's got going and he already tweeted about it this week. So a lot of good things there. Yeah. John tells great stories. This is, if you like good stories, this is a good podcast for that too. We've got, we've got some good plans for the end of the show after the part with John. So once you get to the end of that, stay tuned for more. But first, how do we, how do people get in touch with us? So we want everyone to be in touch with us with ideas for the show and things like that. Easiest way to do that is on Twitter at Smattering Show. You can also email us, thesmatteringshow at gmail.com. Uh, but the more important thing we're asking everyone to do these these last couple episodes is if you take a moment to please um, rate and review the podcast on whatever app you listen on, and then head over to the YouTube channel, give us a subscribe over there. You can leave some comments, positive or negative, your choice. Um, but we we really are, are, we have many more listeners than we do reviews, and that would really help us spread the word. So we would appreciate anyone giving us some help there. And yeah, the, the, the second part of the show is going to be really interesting. We're going to take a take a look at the Smatterfolio after one month of our fun little fund, uh, fundraising for a charity competition we have going on. So we're going to do a quick overview of the portfolio, talk about what a weird month January was, and uh, uh, talk about some of the individual stocks a little bit too. All right, Jeff. All right, everybody, on to the, uh, on to the conversation with John. We'll see you on the backside, everybody. All right, I got to say... John Maxfield, um, I, w I want to tell a story first about the first time I ever really met you. Um, I had kind of started to establish myself a little bit as a financial writer. You were already pretty established. One of the people that I admired the most, and we were at a conference together. And a few months before, I had been kind of lucky enough to piss off Team Boone Pickens in such a way that he wanted me to interview him. So I spent some time with him and did some cool interviews. Anyway, we're fast forward a few months and we're at this conference together and I'm chatting with some people during the social hour and John comes charging up to me and I, I knew who John was and like, there was this moment of fear. I'm like, okay, what did I screw up? What did I, what was I really, really wrong about that? John's going to like call me out on and John comes up and says, Man, I saw your interview with T. Boone Pickens, and I'm such a huge fan. That was amazing. You're a god. And I, my response was like, thanks, because I was so fucking nervous. <laughs> like, I I was like, I was paralyzed because like you're one of the people that I admired the most um, as, a, as a peer. And it's kind of weird. We've gotten to know each other a lot better over the years. And I wanted to bring that up because I think sometimes – we kind of start to seem untouchable and like unrelatable as, as we become more established in our professions, particularly when we're public facing in some way. And one of the things I want to do with, with these sorts of conversations is kind of open things up a little bit, John. So you've become really over the past decade or so, 
I think kind of a preeminent expert in the U.S. banks, in the U.S. banking system, the U.S. banks over really the past couple of hundred years. Let's talk through your origin story. How did you get from a guy in law school to a guy writing financial financial writer for The Molly Fool to becoming now a, an expert on banks? You know what I, I remember about that, Jason, is that I was like, God, that took balls. And because you went down there and it was, that was probably your first one of those big ones. And I remember my yeah. first big interviews and like, God, you're so nervous when you go and do that. And like, it takes so much courage to go and do something like that. And you're so nervous. And then the asymmetry of power in a situation like that is so right. acute. Yep. So acute. Is I got his attention because I wrote a headline that said T. Boone Pickens is dangerous for American energy companies. Right. So. Yeah, that's you're, you're you're exactly right. It 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 can be very very intimidating. I guess the place. Uh, I guess the thing to say is that ever since I was a little kid, and I, I joke about this, but it's also kind of true. Like I don't, I'm not a very social guy. Um, I like to like the thing that energizes me is figuring stuff out. And so ever since I was a kid, like I would go from one subject matter to another another subject matter to another subject matter, and then I would kind of like learn everything I can about it, and then. I would know I'd be done with that subject matter when I could reduce it to a simple sentence and then you could pack that away and put it in your brain and move on to the next thing. And then just, you could unpack it at any point later on, you know, it, it allows you to retain that information. If you can if you really work through it and reduce it to your own knowledge, you know? Um, and so the financial crisis hit and I'd gone to law school, I'd had federal clerkship and all these different things, but really what I was most focused on was avoiding getting a real job. Um, and so I, cashed in a bank investment uh, that had been made on my behalf and moved to DC. And I was just going to read as many books as possible until I ran out of money. And then I was going to get a real job. That's basically what I was going to do. And it was right around that time that the financial crisis hit. And I remember thinking like, why did, what, what just caused that? You know? So I was like, I'll take six months. Like I grew up around like no, no bankers in my family, but like we've always been investors in banks. And so I've been around a lot of bankers and like, you know, you, you, it's not rocket science. Let's just put it that way, okay? And so I thought, ah, oh, this will take me like six months to, to, to crack this code, you know what I mean? But like 12 years later, like still working on it. I'd never spent that much time working on something. And I dealt with complicated things. Like, and so I thought, you know, um, this, this brings me to last year. And I thought like, I'm going to give it one more year. If I can't crack the code, I'm going to move on to the next thing. But that's, that kind of brings me up to, up to today. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that I want to mention too, John, is that a lot of the work you do now is targeted at the banking industry, the insiders, banking executives, banking professionals, not as much to retail investors. Um, but I'm a very firm believer that if you're an individual investor and you're picking your own stocks and you're looking to grow your own wealth, if you don't have an understanding of how banking works, then you're not as good of an investor as you can be. And you're probably a worse investor and getting worse returns as a result. So kind of the first question I want to ask is how do you think about banks as an investment category? Okay. So if you think about a bank, um, well, so a bank is just an entity, right? It's just like, a, there's all these other entities, right? That are just businesses that create, that create value. So you have to say the, the way to understand banking is to understand them um, in, uh, in relation to other types of businesses, okay? So a bank, it's just like a shoe store. It buys something at low price and sells it at a high price. But instead of selling shoes, a bank sells, buys and sells money. But that's where the, that is where the differences end. Beyond that, it's like, Banking is to business as being on the moon is to being on the planet Earth in, 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 in gravity. When you're on the planet Earth, you have to work to get up off the ground, right? When you're on the moon, you have to work to stay on the ground. Right. So it, the forces, the, the gravitational forces in these businesses are completely opposite. You can grow a bank as quickly as you want, okay? And the reason you can grow a bank as quickly as you want is because banks face an infinite demand curve. Okay. You loan money at a low enough rate and easy enough terms. You can literally, the, 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 the demand curve would literally go straight up. Yeah. 
you say, like, John, I'm going to, Jason, like, I'm going to lend you, you know, how much money do you want for a 1% interest rate, non-recourse? You never got to pay it back, basically. You say, well, let me think about that, John. I'll take infinity dollars. You know what I mean? Because that's what right. you do. There's a lot. I mean, like, you would literally walk through a mathematical proof like, to, to show that that's the logical thing to do. And so what that means is that, like, the onus is entirely upon you, the banker, to govern your own growth, which is not what we're naturally designed to do, right? We're naturally designed to, like, chase after the short-term profit and the short-term gains. And so if you think about, like, now if you think about, like, the shoe store, you think about a Mercedes dealership. Let's say you have a Mercedes dealership and you drop the price of a Mercedes, all the Mercedes to $10. How many would you buy, Jeff? All of them. I would buy all of the Mercedes. Yeah. <laughs> but then you wouldn't, would you? Well, no, I would buy one Mercedes because that's all I need. Yeah. All right. Well, five, yeah. whatever. Right. But you right. wouldn't buy like infinity Mercedes. No, that's, that's exactly right. Every Everybody would buy one. Yeah. Or five, whatever. I mean, like. But that so, brings it to the other side of that equation, right? If they're selling Mercedes for $10, they're going to run out of money before they run out of customers. That's exactly right. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. But. In banking, because you're just constantly arbitraging, you go out to the, there are markets you go out to and basically get an infinite amount of money if you're yeah. a bank too. Because like, it's, it's you're the, in that process too, right? And so like right. if somebody will you know, give you lean enough terms, you can do the same. Um, so the, what this means- The, the that, flip side is there is, is how you think about the differences is one talks about cost of goods sold. One talks about net interest margin, right? It's figuring out the cost of, money versus what you can sell it for the cost to buy those shoes versus what you can sell it for. That's true. That, that That's very true. But I mean, there is a cost of goods sold in, in, in banking as well. And that cost of goods sold is the credit cost, right? right. You'll have some of these go bad, mm -hmm. but this is, a, this is another difference between banking and other businesses. Cause you know, your cost of goods sold when you're selling shoes, but you don't know your cost of goods sold when you're making loans until like the loan is either paid back or it goes, bad. So you're right. sitting for a long time on this stuff. You have no idea. I mean, you have, you can have a general sense for how it's going to perform, but like you do, you don't know until you know. And so what all this means is that, so because you have this, your face is infinite demand curve. And because you don't know your cost of goods sold until it's either too late or until it is too late. Right. What that means is that that puts a banker into a position where you are incredibly prone to commit error because all the forces are pushing you to do the wrong thing, right? Make loans now, grow fast now, blah, 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 blah. Like the analysts are telling you to do that. Your shareholders are telling you to do that. Your employees want to do it because they'll get bigger bonuses. Like you're inside your internal body. It is telling you to do it. All the forces are telling you to do it. So that leaves you really, really vulnerable to committing error, right? Hence the, hence the old saying, what is a banking crisis? Something that happens about once every decade. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so not only are you prone to commit error, but you're incredibly um, vulnerable to errors that are committed. And that is for two reasons. Number one, um, because a bank is leveraged 10 to one, <laughs> like yeah. 10 to one, like no other businesses are leveraged 10 to one. Yeah. Right? I, this is something I try, whenever I'm talking about banks, the, the way I try to describe it is people think of banks as where all the money is but it's really where all the debt is, right? For every hundred dollars they bring in, they lend out 90 of it and they keep 10 to handle the day-to-day -day churn of deposits. Exactly right. That's exactly right. And so like, but in, in a lot of people talk, like one of the lessons from the financial crisis was that like banks needed more capital, right? Banks need more capital. Banks, capital is king, capital is king, capital is king, right? Well, it's when you actually dig into it, capital is not king, okay? Capital, I, the way I think about it is capital is court jester. Confidence is king. Let me explain. Continental Illinois was the biggest bank. It was the sixth biggest bank in the country in 1984. Seventh biggest bank in the country, 1984. Big bank up in Chicago. A little bank down in Oklahoma City, Penn Square Bank, failed as a result of making bad energy loans. Well, they had been selling loans to these big banks in different big cities, and they sold a bunch of loans to Continental Illinois. People heard about that. And they depositors ran on the bank. On the bank run. Okay. And it failed. It became the first too big to fail bank. The government went in and seized it. It was eventually sold to Bank of America. And I've got some crazy stories about that, for, but like, we won't go there now. But like, um, 
so it was the biggest bank failure of time, right? What's interesting is that like, if you follow the logic that capital is king, you'd say like, oh, clearly had big losses. So it became undercapitalized. It never lost money. And yet it still failed. Yeah, that, go ahead, Jeff. No, I was going to ask, you, you said a bunch of things in your answer there that kind of made me think about the, the biggest question I had and the reason I was excited to have you on the podcast, which is, so I own about 68 stocks and I have four, three or four bank stocks. Um, what are some things that you would say, like good places to start looking at metrics to look at anything? Cause it is different. It's a different, it's a different animal than looking at, you know, a different type of company. So the first thing I would tell an investor is that like, look, you have to know how all the numbers work. Okay. You have, you, you got to go and you got to figure that out. And that just takes time. Okay. Like the, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to allocate your capital there and, and, and you want to do it in more than the spe speculative capacity, you just got to spend the time. To, to, to learn all that stuff, okay? Um, but once you learn it, you have to forget it, okay? <laughs> and because <laughs> what you then realize is that all of it's made up, okay? But you can't come to that conclusion until you've learned it. Um, but what you realize is that, like, they can literally, like, anything, they can put anything on the balance sheet. That they, I mean, like, say that anything is worth anything on the balance sheet for the most part, okay? And that's because the cost of goods sold is opaque, like we were talking about earlier. Like they just like make it up. Oh, well, that's a good loan or whatever. There's a bank called Washington Federal Bank for Savings in Chicago that um, like if you looked at every metric, okay, you're like, this is a great bank. Consistent growth, consistent profitability, not crazy profitability, not crazy growth, just everything consistent, exactly what you're looking for. And then one day the thing failed. Out of, out of the blue. It, in fact, it even made it through the financial crisis, earned money through the financial crisis. I think every quarter, but I know every year, okay? And then in 2017, it just failed out of the blue. And then they go in there and like literally like 80%, they, they lost, the FDIC, I think lost 80% on that thing. 80%, okay? Like, so they were lying the whole time. They're lying the whole time. Yeah. And now that's an extreme case, but it illust it's illustrative of the fact that the bank, they can say just about anything they want. Now you have the regulators, but the regulators, they're not much to write home about. Let me be clear. I'm not anti-regulator, but like, I know, like, they're just not, you know what I mean? If, like, you're, if, you, if you're, if you're regulating JP Morgan Chase, there's no way to verify every single financial in instrument and every single financial liability on its balance sheet. There's, it's, you, there's literally not enough money to pay people to do that. Well, well it wouldn't matter how much money there is. I mean, they, they just couldn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I mean, Jamie Dimon is, he's a savant. He's a true savant. Um, and I think he has a good handle of JP Morgan. I mean, I think, you think, I, I think it's proven out through their performance. Um, but um, I mean, it, this stuff is, it's, it's really, really difficult. And so what that means is that, so, so you, you need to understand the, the person at the top. You really gotta, you gotta like, you, if you, you gotta, you wanna meet him, you at least wanna see him like, giving speeches or something like that. Like you can go on YouTube, like you've got to get a feel for the person. Is this person a, an honest and trustworthy person? Like, like that is what it's all about. Cause if you, I could go through a whole analysis, but this is where I end up at the end of the day, that the thing that differentiates the performance of really good banks from, from your pedestrian banks or your really bad banks is one thing. And it is the immunity of a CEO, either the natural or the acquired immunity of a CEO to avarice and envy, okay? Um, and so- Because that's the thing that prevents the chasing that infinite curve. So Buffett, he talks in his 1990 shareholder letter, I think there's like six paragraphs in there where he talks about why they bought 10% of Wells Fargo, which is kind of funny now, but like, um, it, was, it worked out, it was a great bet for them. And like, and, and he explained- Yeah, no, it worked out incredibly well. And you know, the, I'm going to preface what you're about to say with something else that Buffett said, and that's, you know, being willing to change your mind when the facts change. That's exactly right. Yeah. But in that letter, I mean, like if that, that's probably the, that's probably there's, there's two or three really, really seminal things that every bank investor should read. Uh, but Buffett's 1990 shareholder letter is one of those things that every bank investor should. I mean, I like, I, I almost have it memorized and he's talks in there about the institutional imperative. The institutional imperative is when um, it's the tendency to like watch what everybody else is doing and just to follow along and, and do it. And the, the 
the tendency in banking is so strong to do that mm-hmm. because let's say you're in a little, you're in a town, right? You're in well, whatever a city, Denver, and you're a major bank in Denver. And you have these three other major banks in Denver and those banks are at the top of a cycle and they're just going gangbusters, right? So they're cutting their terms. They're cutting their rates to get business, to gain market share. So if, if you were to be prudent and keep, you know, stay at your terms, stay at your rates, you're going to lose market share, right? To these imprudent competitors. And then they're going to fail, right? Now, maybe you'll catch it back up and maybe you won't, you know what I mean? So it's a little bit of a game. Um, but you are like every force is driving you to stick to, to do what everybody else is doing. And that's what gets everybody into trouble. And so like, and it's those, it, those emotions of fear and in, or greed and envy. Those are the things that drive you to do that. That's what drives the institutional imperative. So if you are immune to that, so then you, then what you need to do is then you go down this, this road and say like, what makes somebody immune to those two things? Okay. Then, and, and here's what I believe it is. And this is not, you can't like prove this statistically in a, in a statistically significant way, but like R squares are for clowns. Okay. R squared, let me, I'm going on the record. R squares are for clowns. Like that is not how the world works. And most people who pull R squares don't even know how regression analysis works anyways. Okay. Right. But regression like, analysis. That's R squared. Yeah. Yeah. It's R squared. Yeah. So it's like, like, so if you step back and you get to know all the top guys, like personally on a deep personal level, you realize that there are really two ways to acquire that immunity. One is to be a natural savant like Jamie Dimon, okay? But the other, and this is really interesting, you dig into all of these guys' past and they, all of them, there is a tra- some sort of tra- acute tragedy or hardship that they faced that steals them against the pressure to chase short-term growth. Like, cause they're just basically like, well, screw it. Like, the analysts are putting pressure on me. I don't like these guys don't know what like a bad situation is. Like there's no, like there's no threat to like me not chasing this stuff. It's going to be worse than stuff I've dealt with. And every single one of them other than Jamie Dimon has gone through something like that. That's interesting. Go ahead. It almost, yeah. it almost sounds like, I don't, I don't want to mischaracterize it, John. So you tell me if I'm wrong, but it almost sounds like there's this constant balancing act for banking CEOs to sort of like, toe the line of what's prudent, what's smart, what's risky, but know like when not to go too far. Like, you know, like let, let the forces that sort of push you towards risk, push you only so far. And then, so you kind of pull back and it's, it sounds like the successful CEOs are the ones who can sort of straddle that line over the long term and not be so far away from it that they lose share, like you were saying, but not go so far over it that their bank then becomes at risk of failing. Don't be too ambitious. The ones that are super ambitious, bad news bears. The, it's, the, it's the ones that are content taking their 12%, their 14%, their 14% every single year, and then waiting, biding their time, knowing that their competitors are going to take some share at the top of the cycle, and that they're going to get it all back, plus some at the bottom of the cycle when their competitor fails, and they get it for nothing. So it's, it's the ones who are able to manage ambition, again, to fight the, you know, the inclination towards fear uh, or towards greed and envy, they're, they're the ones, they are the, that is the thing you have to identify. That's the thing that will get a bank through. All right. Let's, let's talk a little bit about what's FinTech is a big word. It's getting a lot of interest and there's, a, I think there's somewhat of an expectation that there's going to be disruption in the banking industry. And I'm just curious as, as somebody that understands the, the banking sector deeply, but also kind of gets technology broadly and sees what's happening in the real world. You get young kids. Um, h- how do you think about FinTech and the role of banking broadly and how is it going to impact banking for investors? What's, what's going to change? What's going to stay the same? All right. So two points on FinTech. Number, the first point is that um, we are in a period of time right now in the banking industry that the change is moving slower than ever before. Okay. That's not what the narrative tells you. For the the banking industry, right. Everything is this, you have this revolutionary change in banking. (laughs) Not true. The only people who say that are people who have no idea what's happened in the past. The things we are facing today are so insignificant. It's, It's like putting a hole in the side of your building so a car can drive up to it. That's what we're doing right now. That is how insignificant these technological changes are. Okay. Like 
the reason these people, but the problem is the fintech has captured the narrative. Okay. You go and you talk to these fintech people say, okay, like, what's, what's the deal? Oh, banks like don't know how to innovate. They're old and stodgy. They're, they don't move fast, you know? Like, okay. Tell me about, you know, your company you work for, you know, it's like a 26 year old, you know? <laughs> oh, you know, we've been around for 18 months and uh, do you make money yet? No, we don't make any money. Well, like, like, okay. Like, do you know how old the average bank is in the United States? No, well, it's 102 years old. The average bank in the United States is 102 years old. Okay. The oldest bank in this, in this country was founded by Alexander Hamilton. Right. Okay. You go into Bank of New York's headquarters in downtown New York, you're right. not going to say like, these guys aren't innovative. I mean, like, you're like, holy cow. These guys are so far beyond. I mean, like, the, the fintech narrative is wrong. It's wrong. Right. And the problem with the fintech narrative being wrong is it puts pressure on bankers to make bad decisions with technology, to spend a bunch of money on technology. It's, again, part of the institutional imperative. And we've seen examples of this through time. There's a bank, uh, it's called First Union. First Union merged or effectively acquired Wachovia. There is no first mover advantage in banking. Zero. There just, there just isn't. I mean, it's, it, in fact, if anything, there's a first mover disadvantage. Again, remember, banking doesn't operate like typical business. It's like the moon to the planet Earth, okay? Same thing with first mover advantage in technology. The thing with technology is that it is a distribution. You have to constantly be improving. But like, that's what you do. That's what everybody does. You just gotta be, you just gotta be, it's like, you gotta get the new windows. You gotta get the new, you know, this is, this is that. You're like, there's no reason to make it into something that it isn't. And, and the, old, the people who do that are the people in FinTech who are trying to sell you something. And, and, and it's injurious. And, and, and yeah, so that's, that's my take on FinTech. <laughs> That's you, good. I, I think it's important because it's a reminder that for banks, the things that banks do really well aren't necessarily the things that can be advantageous for some of the fintech companies that are doing things that are useful for consumers. And what banks do, should be able to do really well are the things that you were talking about, lending lending money in a responsible way, generating a good return on that loan in a safe way that's protecting depositors at the same time. Again, this goes to the point that banking is like diametrically opposed to typical business, the pressures. And like, it is not scarcity that is a constraint in banking. It's abundance. Abundance is the problem. It's abundance. Like every single time there's been a problem, it's been caused by an abundance of money in the market. Abundance of money causes people to do stupid things because it's all sitting on their balance sheet, burning a hole in their pocket. So they want to go and do stupid stuff with it. So abundance leads to failure. Abundance leads to failure. That's just, that's the story of banking. Well, because it sits on top of the, the economic demand cycle, um, whether it's a consumer bank or bank that focuses on a certain industry or those things are cyclical. And when you're leveraged, when the cycle turns, if, if you haven't been responsible in your, in your, in your banking, you're, you're going to get hit in an outsized way. That's exactly right. Yeah. It, it, it happens like that. Then they just like overnight, the FDIC comes in and, Friday afternoon and it's, and it's all over. Jason, can I, let me, let me share something. Can I share something real quick before we go to this? Please. Um, okay. So this will take like a couple minutes, but like, it's really interesting. I think we'll see. Um, so, uh, last year, uh, uh, if it sucks, Jeff's just going to cut it out. I'll tell you. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. So last year, this is the first time I'm like publicly talking about this. So last year I decided I was going to consolidate all my knowledge in banking. And I was going to, I decided to do that because I'd gone through all these other uh, subject matters in the past and I was able to reduce them to a, a simple, simple thing and then pack it away and then move on to another subject matter. Well, I figured when I started this with banking, like six months, eight months, two years max, it's it, like 12 years later, 13 years later, 11 years later, I was like, what's going on? Like, I haven't been, I haven't been able to reduce it. And I have like, I've accumulated probably one of the finest private libraries in the banking industry. So like, I've, and I've read most of the books and like, and I know all the top guys. I've spent a ton of time with all of them. Like, and they just like let they just they answer the questions I ask, and I ask a lot of questions. Um, and I ask their friends, their colleagues, and I go through all their SEC. I mean, like I've studied this. I've really, really, really studied it from all the different verticals. And I just couldn't reduce it. I just couldn't reduce it to that simple single sentence. But I was working like sixteen to eighteen hours a day. The only hour I let myself off if I wasn't traveling was um, to play pass with my boy, I have 10-year-old 10, 10 twin sons. 
and we play pass every day. And so, and I love doing I mean, that. Encourage but, people to go to Twitter. You can see Max Field's good, good arm. He can, he can throw, he can throw a football over those mountains. Let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> I got some practice. Um, and so, and what I did is I started at the beginning of bank in 1790 and I just read contemporary materials all the way through to today. And it was just like 16, 18 hours a day, every seven days a week, every single, I mean, just, it was insane. And do it um, for another 59 years and you'll catch up to Warren Buffett. Exactly. And so, uh, I realized it was literally two 30 in the morning one night I was sitting up in bed reading and my wife was asleep next to me. And it's when it struck me, what the thing that I had missed and that everybody else had missed. And it's kind of a technical thing, but it's a really important thing. And it's important, not just in banking, but in, in every other subject matter that you want to master. And it's a thing called periodization. Do you guys know what that is? Periodization? Are you familiar with no. that? Periodization is when you break a historical subject matter down into eras. Okay. Right. right. Now that seems like an academic thing, but if you want to dominate intellectually a subject matter, you've got to do it. It's, oh, you have got to reduce it. You got to simplify, 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 simplify. And well, so I can see for banking important. how that would be imminently important because th this is an industry that has gone through massive changes from one period to the next. That's right. And so like, it, it, it's again, it's that same thing. You're, you're packing it, you're packing it into your brain in a simple way that then you can then unpack it. So it's, it's accessible. You've got to have all that accessible to you if you want to master it, right? And so I was reading, and this is like middle of the night, and it is an article in the Hartford Current newspaper from 1921. And because the Hartford Current had uh, the best annual financial review of any newspaper in the country. And so I would start each year by reading the Hartford Current's annual financial review for that year. And then I, I know where to go and look, you know, for that year. And um, they were talking about the allocation of deposits in the state of Connecticut between, <laughs> like sounds really boring, but savings banks, trust companies, state chartered commercial banks, and nationally chartered, federally chartered commercial banks, and how those, the dynamics of those deposits were changing. And then they also broke it down into consumer and commercial deposits. And what you saw was that the growth, there was a, an explosion in consumer deposits, explosion. I was just like, they shot up. And what you realize, and you work backwards from that, and you realize like, holy shit, like in the 1880s, the average person had four dollars on deposit. Four bucks. Okay. Twenty-seven dollars, like something like twenty-seven dollars today. Right. Not not much. Okay. Still a minuscule amount of money compared to today. That's nothing. It's yeah. nothing. It, what you realize is that in that period in the eighteen it was around the eighteen seventy, where the birth where there's a the the birth of disposable income. What you had was you had this you had this huge surge in deposits flooding into the United States, okay? So for the first 96 years in the U.S. history, from 17, so when George Washington became president to like uh, 1874 or six, like in, in one of those years, um, the first 96 years, we ran a trade deficit every single year, but four years, okay? The next 96 years, we ran trade surplus every year for 96 years, for all but four years. Since 1973, we run a trade deficit every single year. So trade deficit, trade surplus, trade deficit. That's that's the history. That's the economic history of the United States. Okay. Well, when you move from a trade deficit to a trade surplus, or a trade surplus to a trade deficit, you're, it's like turning around the um, the flow of a dam. That powerful, like I mean, you you were talking an enormous amount of money. This is the biggest economy in the world. Okay, and that yeah. that those flows just totally turn. And when those flows turn. It like it screws everything up. Everything it knocks everything out out of equilibrium. And so when you look back to banking, so that the, the traditional way they broke it down, the scholars have broken it down into periods that they've broken it down into eras, is whether there was uh, the, it, it, the presence or the absence of a central bank like authority. Okay, so it's not arbitrary. It's not arbitrary at all. But the problem is that when they break it down like that, here's what you get. So I don't know if you guys can see this, but like, so this is the his, this is the population of banks in the United States going all the way back to 1790 or 1800. I think. So you see it goes like goes up like that, and then that that's like I think 1921, and then you have this ag agricultural depression that leads to all these bank failures, and then you have the Great Depression that pushes the banks down, and then you have the Great Moderation when risk appetite was really was, was really hampered. Kind of the post World War II era. Yep, that's right after World War II exactly. And then you have this little tail that was caused by something else. 
and then consolidation ever since then. Well, if you look at the periodization, how they how they how the scholars kind of broken down the periodization, this is the line for the modern era where it starts. Well, you look like you look at that and you say, like, come on. Like the new era doesn't it's not reflected in the data. It's like a train that's like it's, the train doesn't even stop at the station. It's just like it's just an it's an arbitrary point. It picks up the mailbag. You know, it doesn't even slow down. Right. It picks up the mailbag and keeps going. You know what I mean? Right. So you're like, oh, like it's totally arbitrary relative to the data. It's not arbitrary. It doesn't seem arbitrary, which is why nobody realized what the problem was. Because it seems not arbitrary. And so when you look at me like, oh, there's something, there's this other force. And what I realized is that other force that causes those big things is liquidity. But not just any type of liquidity. Novel, I call it this novel liquidity flows. So new liquidity flows. So this is money. It's not money that sloshes around in a system, like from like, Checks or from like checking accounts, like MMA accounts or these other types of accounts or the brokerage accounts, or whatever. That doesn't cause these huge fundamental changes. What causes huge fundamental changes is when a ton of money comes into the system from another system, or goes out of system into another system, or if it just comes up through the ground from the Federal Reserve, like entity. And so that's that is how like the eras break. That when you step back and look at the data. That's what you realize is that it's all about these novel liquidity flows. And so where that takes you is that you realize, okay, this point about abundance, this is the issue. When you have these huge novel liquidity flows, the money piles up somewhere. The banks look at that money. They say, we're going to go arbitrage that money because that's how we make money. So they go and they arbitrage it by doing stupid stuff. And that is what explains all of banking, right? And so then you break this down one step further. You talk about like that what it takes to run a good bank, that immunity to greed and envy. That's why, because it's the ability to deal with those huge piles of money and to maintain your composure and your, and, and your discipline in the face of those huge piles of money that dictates whether you're going to be a good bank or not. And that's just how it is. Let's be honest. There's not many entrepreneurs out there that are wired for somebody to say, okay, you have an infinite access to capital and for them to not, yeah, a lot be, of really be prudent. <laughs> yeah. Here, here's unlimited money. Don't spend it all in one place. Yeah. yeah. Don't go just here's some money, somebody else's money. Right. Yeah. I mean it, it's the it's the uh marshmallow study. Right. And it's like, do you want one marshmallow now or two marshmallows later? I'll take one marshmallow now. <laughs> Thank you very much. You know, right. <laughs> right. in the hand is better than two in the bush. You know what I mean? Right. We're not we're not we're not wired for that delayed gratification. So okay, so I got a couple things for you real quick. Mm -hmm. Your average investor. So these are, these are your, these are your first, first of all, where can people find you? Uh, you the Twitter is probably the best place to find me. Yeah. Max field on banks, right? At max yep. field on banks. Yep. 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 And from there they can find just about everything else you need to do. They can get in touch with you that way. So, yeah. 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 And, and, and if anybody wants, it, I, I try to be very um, responsive to, to anybody who has questions or anything, but I, I do my best at that. Reach out to John. I encourage it, people. I do encourage it. All right. Three questions. Jeff, you go first. All right. What's the best resources out there for people who want to start learning more about investing in banks? Oh, gosh. The FDIC. The F so the banking industry is the only industry where we have data on every single institution, public or private. The FDIC has all of that. In fact, they've just redone their data portal, and it's way better, way better. Go to the FDIC, learn, learn, look at the data. I mean, so it's all right there. You can get it all going back to 1992. That's that's a great place. Another great place is um, Fraser. Okay, so yeah, I would say Fraser is maybe second. Uh, yeah, Fraser second. So like Fraser is it's like a, it's run by the the Federal Reserve of um, I think St. Louis or Kansas City. But it has it's, it's, it keeps all these documents through time on that relate to banking and finance. And so you can get basically like any old book on finance or banking like all for free there. So it's it's an amazing resource. Um, and the third is just like I mean SEC. You know, like you got Edgar. You got to use Edgar. You got you got to know how the, all that stuff yeah. works and spend some time in the SEC documents. Okay, so most interesting bank that you've studied, and what can it teach investors? Okay. Okay, there's this bank down in Dallas, Texas that's like incredibly cool. Okay. Um, well, second, well, first of all, let me tell you about the, there's a bank in Abilene, Texas that the CEO and I, we've been going back and forth on this thing for a while. 
Um, it's like the highest, I mean, it trades for like four times book value, which is like the typical bank trades for like 1.8, 1.7. And it, it trades like that consistently. So why is it trade so high? Well, it's because it's, it's got just a like really consistent earnings stream. The standard deviation of its profitability is lower than the standard deviation of any other bank's profitability, okay? So it trades like a bond in effect, okay? So it's like, it's almost moved itself in a different place in the capital stack. Um, so then that's first financial uh, bank shares in Abilene, Texas. So it's just, it's a really interesting story. And like, that's another bank that if you're gonna get into banking, study that bank, it's a really interesting bank. The most interesting bank that, that I'm watching right now is called Triumph Bank Over. I don't know if we've talked about this, Jason, but like Triumph is a, is a I think there's four and change, four billion and change in Dallas, Texas. It's run by this guy named Aaron Graff. And Aaron is a good buddy of mine. And Aaron hates when I compliment him, but I'm going to do it anyways, because I'm not going to tell him I'll, I'll talk about him on this podcast. Um, Aaron is like, he is the most, uh, I have never seen a brain work like Aaron Graff's brain works. And you meet Aaron, and you're like, oh, he's just like a normal guy. And you start talking to him, you're like, oh, no, 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 no. This is, you're dealing with a totally different animal here. I mean, this guy has got a brain on him that like, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's pretty impressive. And the way he makes decisions is, is incredible. And where he's found himself is that they've, through a series of well-timed, prudent decisions, they've positioned themselves in a place where they are basically re rewiring the payment system in the U.S. trucking industry. Okay. And you say, well, this seems like a niche. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's a niche, but you know what it's, how much that's worth? 8% of US GDP. Right. <laughs> okay. I mean, it, and this guy is doing it. There, there's a lot of like naysayers because they throw it in the too hard pile. But once you crack, get past the too hard pile and you look at what they're doing, you're like, okay, yeah, this is a, this is a home run all day, every day. Love it. Big fan of those specialist banks that crack a code like that, figure out something, and then go on to generate huge, huge returns. Yeah. All right, John Maxfield, my friend, this has been a lot of fun. Find him on Twitter. Go check out St. Louis Fred, Fraser, FDIC, and, of course, your good old Edgar on SEC. You guys are the best. Love you guys. <laughs> Thanks fun. for having me on. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. See you, buddy. We'll see Thanks, you. John. Yeah. Okay, friends, hope you really enjoyed that interview with John Maxfield. Jeff and I, we need we need to go have. Uh, how about we have a Celsius instead of instead of coffee? What do you say? Have a Celsius. <laughs> that would be that would be a more appropriate stock based choice, I think. Yes. Yeah. Here's the thing: we're only going to have Celsius if the people with Celsius agree to start advertising on our show. That's right. We drive a hard bargain. Okay, we're back. We we had coffee. Nobody from Celsius called us. What a what a weird month January was. It as, was as an investor, like it was good though. Right? I mean, you look at your portfolio and it was it's good, right? It, two things stuck out to me. One is how quickly a month like that can completely change how you feel about your portfolio. Like I was astonished at the amount I was down overall on December thirty first compared to the amount I was still down, but not as much by on January 31st. That was the first thing you forget after such a long, you know, prolonged, mostly down period, how quickly things can turn around. But the other thing that jumped out at me was, oh man, it reminded me of 2020 and 2021 where yep. every day goes up every, yeah, everything goes up every day. It was ridiculous. And it started to give me that same feeling of, I should have bought more when it was down. <laughs> I missed my opportunity. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, you know, it's funny because we are now 10 days into February. We're doing this review a little bit late just because of bad timing with my vacation. But now the last week or so is starting to feel like 2022 again. So it all the things we've been talking about for all these months about the emotions around investing and trying not to get too caught up in them, we're all there in the past month and 10 days, I feel like. So it was, it was wild. Yeah. After, after one of the, the, I think it was the best January in a couple of decades. I don't remember exactly how long, but like one of the best Januaries in a very, very long time, we just had a bad week. Right. And it's like the worst week since, I don't know, December. And, you know, it's just, it's that context is important. And I think like the big thing that are, it got me kind of thinking about is number one. Yeah. It's, 
it's refreshing. It's certainly rejuvenating as an investor where you go, go through one of those prolonged stretches. And I can tell you, I've been doing this for a, a lot longer than you have, Jeff. Um, and this was the first time, I guess, really during the financial crisis that there was like a prolonged period. I think maybe 2012, um, it was 2010. There was the, 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 what they call it, they were calling it the double dip recession, right? We were coming out of the great recession and it seemed like the economy was stalling again. Um, and there was kind of a bad period. Um, but this is easily like the longest, like significant down. Period. I mean, I think 2021 was, or 2022 was the, like one of the five or six worst ye full years, like actual calendar year, January one through 1231 on record. And I mean, that says a lot about it. Um, but here's the other part, dude. And we'll talk about this as we get into the smatter folio. Um, the smattering unportfolio, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of put this out there was by far the best performing group of stocks. So the four stocks that we literally said, these are exemplary of the kind of businesses we have no interest in owning. Yeah. Vastly out. <laughs> absolutely crushing us. Vastly vastly outperformed us. Uh, so, well, team audience was close, was close. Um, but here's the other thing. And this is, so this is through today, what I'm giving you. So this is as of market close on the February 10th. On average, those five portfolios, so to review, Jeff has his three stocks. I have my three stocks. The audience voted and picked, you guys all picked your three stocks. Jeff and I collectively picked three more stocks that's team smattering. And then there's the four stocks that are the unportfolio. On average, they're all up 17%. You know, six weeks, six weeks into into the year. Yeah, which is just after, especially after what we just went through the last 16 months, it's just bizarre. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a reminder that the, in the short term, you just, you don't know. You don't, you don't know, you can't predict. And even maybe this, maybe this sounds like I'm trying to justify why these, Companies that we do not view very favorably are, are are proving the best investment so far. But again, we talk about it, and even even a year, we're doing a year for the for the full contest. You know, you you, you flip a coin, right? Yeah, and what's interesting to me is so out of the all the stocks in this portfolio, these little mini three and four stock portfolios within our bigger one, only two had actually um, released earnings since be, before the month ended so yep. out of the entire portfolio all of the other movement is largely not related at all to any serious business fundamentals i don't believe there was any huge news out of any of these companies um so that's going to be the interesting thing you know just as a reminder to everyone that's a bit. we're, we're going to review the portfolio briefly every month just to kind of see where we're at but we're going to do in-depth kind of talking through the portfolio each quarter because that's when we're going to choose our winner and give money to the, that winning team's charity and all that stuff. And the reason for the longer review after each quarter is also that by then everyone, all of the companies or most of them will have reported their earnings, right? So we have some actual news to talk about what's different about this company now versus three months ago. But we're also going to be talking about which charity Jeff's going to be giving money to. So yeah, you know. we'll see. We'll yeah. see. Um, yeah. But yeah, so like as of January 31st, only Taiwan Semiconductor and Tesla had actually uh, reported results. So we'll we'll right. talk about them a little bit as we go through. But so I guess let's let's jump in a little bit. Let's quickly go through again. So a lot of these didn't really have any news, but we can give the numbers real quick. Why don't you kick us off with your your three, Jason? How did they do in January? And is there anything worth adding about them right now as we're a little bit into February? Yeah. So so my por my portfolio, my three stocks, I've uh, finished up fifteen. Uh, fifteen percent on average. Um, and the funny thing about it is that so Trex, right, the one that's like most exposed to residential real estate and housing and all that kind of stuff, was the one that did the best. And and what my what that tells me is like how quickly like the sentiment started to shift and how far the stock had fallen, right? right? And there's maybe a similar story when we talk about Meta when we get into the unportfolio, but then you look at Lemonade. This is kind of my moonshot stock this year, my turnaround, it's the same thing. The stock was up 19% on, on nothing. Right. Um, and then of course, CrowdStrike, I think the business that of, of all of these is fundamentally the, 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 in the best position and strongest right now was basically flat. 
right? Because the market's still trying to value and figure out SaaS. It trades for, I don't know what, 13, 14 times sales right now. So yeah, it's, it's still, still pretty expensive. expensive, right? So so the market's still trying to wrap its head around companies, um, valuing companies like that. That's That was kind of my take of, of, of those three. What about what about yours, Jeff? Amazon's reported since the quarter. It reported the end of uh, early February. Yeah, right. They reported February 2nd. Um, Amazon was the first one in my, in my portfolio. I, so my three stocks ended up 15% as well, um, at the end of the month. Um, I'm sure on a, if we go down to the next decimal point, one of us was ahead of the other. I, I didn't go, I, I rounded up. Um, but yeah, same kind of thing. Like, so Amazon up 23% in the month of January with no, no news. Um, you know, they, they reported February 2nd and I, I would say just really briefly, the results were a lot of the same. E-commerce still kind of struggles. AWS growth is slowing a little bit. Um, ad revenue was up 20%. That's becoming a bigger part of the business. So I thought that was a bright spot. Um, but, you know, you, you mentioned how Lemonade was your sort of moonshot. I wouldn't say Amazon was my moonshot, but Amazon was definitely my, my like riskier kind of pick to see. Because right. I do think they'll recover and be a good pick. I just don't know if they'll do it this year, right? We decided to make this a one-year contest. So... Um, but yeah, up twenty three percent, no news. Um, it's down. It's down a good bit since then. It's down like fourteen percent since reporting yeah. earnings. Well, so, yeah, the, the reaction to the earnings was not not great. Um, yeah. and it it's the same thing you just mentioned. It it seems like with my portfolio as well, the ones that were beaten down the most did the best in January on no news. Um, because Amazon was beaten down pretty well. That was up twenty three percent. The mm -hmm. trade desk also beaten down. That was up thirteen percent. The only thing that could have possibly impacted them is other industry, other advertising based companies that did report. They sometimes move in sympathy. Like you see Snapchat will sometimes drag down, um, the trade desks, you know, uh, results just because they're sort of in the same space. Yeah. Um, and snap, snap reported, um, the, on the 31st, I think after the market closed though. Okay. So they wouldn't have been, yeah. So they, but it's finally started to bifurcate. I, th I do think that generally like there's been a little more optimism around um, advertising spending and like this realization, the trade desk is like, they're just, they're in, so in the right place. With yeah. The right they're in their own little customers. world. Yeah. 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 No doubt about. And then no my, my third was outset medical um, again, it, up 9%. Great. That, that's a really good month, um, but no news there. So, and they report middle uh, in a couple of days, actually the 13th. So, those were my three. Uh, why don't you take us through the audience's three picks? Yeah, so Brookfield Infrastructure actually again one reported after it reported early February, but good good month up fourteen percent. This is it's stock this kind of lagged, and I think there's been a little bit of that kind of flight to safety, dividend payer, dividend growth story, higher yield, like all of those things, like real assets that generate really good cash flows. I think that's been a bit of a positive there. Taiwan Semi reported earnings, right? Mid-January, up 25%. Another one that had just fallen a long way. And, you know, we know that the, the cycle for semiconductors is still kind of off, right? And Taiwan Semi is one that's the most exposed to that because they have all the fixed expenses as the, as the foundry, right, as the manufacturer. But I think there's just been this realization of how important, how durable the business is and how resilient it's likely to be. And investors have just kind of kind of come back to it, and it reported decent results. You know that it and laid a pretty good expectation for results for the rest of the year, and kind of what it sees its cadence and its capex plans and that kind of stuff. And investors are are pretty good. But Mercado Libre is up forty percent. That was the second best performing stock of of all of the stocks in the portfolio and unportfolio. And again, just so beaten down. Um, and, and I think a lot of just realization of the importance of not just its e-commerce business, but its payments business in the countries in Latin America where it's become so dominant. Um, and it, 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 this is one that's gone from just dirt cheap in my book to relatively fairly, fairly valued. Yeah. How about the three we picked together, the team smattering portfolio? So this one was the weakest of all the portfolios that this, this one ended January up 3.6%. Um, so the first one, which this one's interesting to me. So Boston Omaha yeah. conglomerate owns a bunch of cash generating businesses. And then they use that money to sort of branch out into other places. They have a lot of minority investments in, in businesses. And it seems like 
they're always sort of around zero <laughs> percent because I, I own super them. Low it, beta stock. Yeah, it, it feels like they're never really up. They're never really super down. Um, yeah. And I, I do think that the market still kind of struggles to know how to value them. Yeah. Um, is it is it a sum of the parts? Is it more than that? Is it less than that? So they were about even for the month, down 0.2%. Um, we don't really know when they report. They're one of those companies that usually doesn't pre-announce it. You just get an alert one day that they reported. Um, right. But the timing would suggest not until late March. So that might be one that we won't really have any information on until right, right after uh, the end of the quarter. Um, the second one was Datadog. Uh, that was up 2%. Um, again, no news, just sort of hanging out around zero. Uh, they report in a couple of days, about a week. Um, and then uh, Simon Property Group, um, they were up 9%. They also uh, reported since the month ended. Um, right, first but, week of February. Yeah, and I, I don't, I, I didn't take a look yet to see how they did. I'll, I'll talk more about them when we cover the February month, but. I'll just say it was great. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk, seriously, it was great. Oh, Are you yeah, just we'll saying that or was it actually great? <laughs> actually, it was great. All right, good. Well, yeah. that's something to talk about when we when we uh, dive in a little deeper later. Yeah. Um, all right, so that brings us to the unportfolio. Now, we there were four stocks in this one because we each wanted to pick two. So why yeah. don't you do your two, Jason, and I'll do mine. Yeah, again, this is probably going to sound like me trying to justify why these stocks absolutely kicked my stock's ass. Um, but AMC, uh, the movie theater, Shane, and, and Blink Charging, the trash business, garbage business. Um, there's a certain somebody out there that would say it's equivalent to to me as 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 a host of a podcast. But anyway, um, up 32 percent and 24 percent respectively. Uh, and and to me, it's a reminder of how how momentum and sentiment will absolutely take control in these short periods of time. And these are stocks that were both down substantially from their highs coming into the year, like some really, really bad performers. And we know AMC like has real fundamental problems with its business, like significant fundamental problems with its business. And they're going to have to make some serious steps just to survive, much less like thrive, right? So uh, investors will take big bets on things in short periods of time. And the thing too with, with AMC, because they so often get caught up in the the reddit crowd that's trying to manipulate the stock and push up yeah. push out the short sellers and all that stuff like if you just you know random uh, randomize the day in the year you could pick a day where amc is up 32 percent in a day <laughs> because they do get yeah. caught up in these weird wild swings like another right. one in the same boat bed bath and beyond bed bath and beyond the other day a company on the brink of bankruptcy was up 96 mm percent -hmm. be mm -hmm. because of yeah you know, people goofing around on Reddit. So that's right. one that's just sort of like a wild card any any day that you look at it. Well, and the key and the key with those is that, you know, to me, they're just totally stay away because unless you're like deep into that and you like spend a lot of time in those in those uh, groups actually reading and kind of get a feel for when things might go crazy. I just I got too much stuff to do, dude, to <laughs> to figure that out, to try to make a quick 500 bucks on a stock trade. Um and I'm not going to risk uh, an outsize amount to try to make a big game because you can lose it so quickly too. And then blink charging. I just want to say this, Jeff, I have, I take serious issue with, with, with this business because they've spent two decades here. This isn't a new company. They've spent two decades telling a story, making secondary offerings, raising more capital and not delivering value to shareholders. And, and I see that story continuing and there's more competitors that have come in. Um, ChargePoint, I think, for example, is another one that's there. There's a lot of others. They're in the worst part of the value chain. Everybody else is is going to make money. You're, you're the real estate, right, where, where the chargers are going to go. You have a durable edge. If you're an automaker, you don't want to have proprietary technology. You want to have some control, right? You want to drive down costs. And and I just think they're not in a good place in the value chain. They've ne 20 years, they've never demonstrated any like per share value for investors. Um, and yeah, this, this, I think this is going to be the worst performing stock of the entire portfolio by the end of the year. And just to sort of circle back quickly b before we dive into the other, the last two here on how crazy January has been and how volatile a company like Blink can be, they ended January up 24%. And here we are 
after the market closes on February 10th. So eight trading days later, they are down, I think, 0.6%. Oh, yeah. They did a secondary offering um, for double-digit percentages below the trading price of the stock. I mean, just, just saying. Yeah. All right. Last two. Then we'll wrap things up here. Um, so Meta, which ended the month up 24%, but actually reported the next day. And then the stock like super jumped because they had Zuck basically said the right words. He, he, he said that they would be, what was it? This is the year of, um, a year of efficiency, a year of efficiency, right? They're still going to spend more on capital expenditures than they have in any other year, except for last year. Right. <laughs> but so, it's the year of efficiency. Um, yeah. So that 24% yeah. increase we saw in January was before those earnings. So um, it, it's done well since then, but. Um, I think it's going to be the best performing stock by the end of the year. I think it's, there's a really good chance. I, th I, I think it's probably going to hold up. I really yeah. do. Because it's unlike still not your two, crazy expensive. Yeah. Unlike the two you picked, which are just sort of like either risky stay away or trash companies, I picked two that very well could do well. I just yeah. would never own them. So it'll be interesting right. to see how right. how they how they shake out. So that was Meta. And then the last one was Tesla, which did report on January 25th um, and ended the month up 41%, which is an astounding jump for one month. And it sits here today at the end of February 10th, up almost 60% on the year. So um, another company that it's not uncommon to see big swings with, it can move on news. It can move on Elon Musk's Twitter habits. Um, so just interesting one to watch. So yeah, that, that port, the unportfolio writ large ended January up 30% and it is around that same point right now. So it's yep. held steady since the end of the month, but um, that's where we, that's where we are. That's, that was the, the quick recap of January. And we will do this again in a couple of weeks as we end February, and then we'll do a longer review probably a whole podcast um, in early April that sort of looks at the quarter um, with a little bit more in-depth thoughts about these companies. Last uh, real quick call out for, we've, we've gotten a few charities. We've gotten three or four charity ideas from, from viewers. Uh, we'd love to get a few more to, to talk about. Um, and we're going to, we're going to announce the charities um, when we do the, that quarterly review. So that's when Jeff's going to have to write a check. So um, if, you have, if you have a charity idea and you haven't sent it to us already, get it to us. Uh, send it to our DMs at Twitter. Don't just tweet it at us because then weird spammy charities pop out of the woodwork and start retweeting us and it gets weird. Um, so DM that to us or send it to the email. Jeff, what's the email? Thesmatteringshow at gmail.com. You can send it there or DM it. Um, and I just want to point out, if anyone wants to see the portfolio, there is a, a public link to a um, Google Sheet that has everything in it. Um, we'll put it in the show notes for this episode. You can also find it in the episode back from December when we announced the portfolio. I believe it's there as well. Or if you just hit us up on Twitter, we can send you the link. Um, but that's where we'll be. You can see the live results, obviously, but that's where we'll list the charities for each of the portfolios. That's where we'll eventually list the winners of each quarter um, and any other information that's, that's helpful. Okay, Jeff. It's a great conversation with John and... Um... Here we are. We're six weeks into the smattering portfolio contest and it's looking rather interesting already. Yes. It's going to be a fun, fun year. Okay. Friends just want to remind you, Jeff and I do love to answer these hard questions about investing. So you got to find your own answers out there, whether it's about banking, whether it's about charge point, or some other weirdo stock you might be thinking about buying, figure out the right answer for you. You can do it. I believe in you. All right, Jeff, we'll see you next time. See you next time.